I want to talk about the relationship between theory and practice. It was just that we should talk about uh, research priorities, but it seems to me that those priorities feed this relationship between theory and practice, and that that relationship sits, or at least should sit, at the heart of what we like to call civilization. So it's kind of um, critical. And I think uh, the way I see it, in my curious uh, metaphorical brain, it's a little bit like the relationship between rhizomes and soil microbes. Soil microbes are my favorite things actually at the moment. Um, where, where, you know, where the roots, uh, the rhizomes make root sugars and feed the microbes and the microbes break down soil and, and feed phosphates back again. So you get that swap. Or um, indeed, um, the relationship between town and country, swapping food, if you like, for creative energy. That interface between theory and practice, between the world of ideas and the world of, um, if you like, stuff, uh, is kind of where I've spent my life so far, trying to sneak ideas into the world, you know, because the world is very resistant to ideas, as you know, and so you have to sort of trick them into uh, accepting them. In my experience, uh, being at that interface, um, it's interesting, but it it gets it makes it means that you get treated with suspicion by sort of both sides. So it can get very interesting uh, because you're neither in my in my case you're neither a proper academic nor a proper journalist, and so everyone thinks you're not really one of us. And yet that interface is where I've sort of stuck because it interests me, and also because I think it matters. I feel a grim fascination, I think I'd say, with the ugliness of our cities and the fact that so much of what we do to them seems to make them uglier and uh, less engaging and less dignifying. There should be a better verb for that. Um, a as environments for ourselves, which is weird, you know, given that we have the choice broadly speaking. So I'm interested in the causal role that um, played in that ugliness generation by what Joseph Rickwit used to call the conceptual poverty of our city discourse. If, like Rickwit, uh, who is a Cambridge academic, as you know, if you study ancient cities as he did, you can't fail to be struck, I think, by the way that those cities um, had intense uh, meaning for their citizens, symbolic resonance, if you like, and that even up to sort of the uh, 17th century, cities continued to, uh, broadly speaking, to provide citizens with that sort of combination of religious affiliation, ancestral interment, and territory which bound together into a sort of single, quite noble, I think, ideal of citizenship um, or maybe identity. So, so to be a citizen was to have meaning and purpose pretty much by definition. And I'm interested that that's not really how we feel about our cities now. As a young architecture graduate, I used to walk home across a bridge um, with a view over the city uh, and the, a sense of exhilaration at the privilege and, I suppose, responsibility, too, of being allowed, I thought, <laughs> to design the world, you know. I thought, that's cool. Um, I hadn't seen this film then, <laughs> which is a 1949 film of the, a very bad book called The Fountainhead, very bad book, not to be read by anyone. Um, uh, but a very interesting film, nevertheless. This is Gary Cooper, who plays, of course, Howard Rourke, who is the uh, hero architect. Um, but what interests me, and I'm going to see if I can make this thing work, is, um, is that Howard Rourke was seen as having the power to save the world as an architect, as a designer. He could save the world. And um, this man, who uh, is even more interesting, is the architect of puppets, uh, whose name was Albert Curie, and who has the power to stop him saving the world. Uh, so he's a bad guy. Um, 
so, so Ellsworth Tui has the power to send entire workforces out on strike and to preempt entire developments, stop them dead in their tracks. Um, you know, I wish. <laughs> but now, um, of course, it's obvious to me what actually a minute role the design professions play in the making of cities. Uh, yet, I still think it's worth fighting for. And I still wonder what it would take for our cities to hold uh, for us such symbolic resonance as those ancient ones did for their citizens. Um, and for them, what, you know, what would it mean and, and how would we engender this for them to be able to give us our sense of identity? So I think the answer to that question is it's about being able to embody our ideas and our ideals in the physical fabric of place. And that, I think, is the role of research. Um, my... I can't see you. Um, but I, I think I might have the reputation of being the only doctoral student ever to have been banned uh, from the faculty <laughs> during the years of their tenure at the Australian Institute. Um, in fact, some of the people come out and say, no, I thought they changed the locks on you. You went back to work. Uh, so no, um, lack of corporate memory, I expect. I was, in fact, banned from the faculty. I regard that as a great distinction. Um, but my PhD research, nevertheless, um, continued, and it was a hunt for the ideas that shaped Sydney. My time doing my doctoral studies coincided with um, four years of um, elected uh, tenure as a city councillor in the city of Sydney, which made it especially interesting. And politically, they were quite exciting times when we made the first heritage list in the city, for example, in, I think, 1992. Uh, one of our colleagues on the Central Sydney Planning Committee, who was, naturally, a developer, labelled this heritage list the Satanic Verses. Um, and uh, when we moved to protect laneways from development and demolition, the government introduced legislation to sack us as the city council. So things got quite exciting. My thesis, though, was titled The Sydney Height of Buildings Story, and this image is, um, is, was sort of critical to it. So what I was interested in is what drove Sydney to ban skyscrapers uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, when everybody else was frantically building them, and uh, in 1912, and what then, uh, nearly 50 years later, uh, caused Sydney just as suddenly to unban skyscrapers. Uh, was it, I wondered, a desire to spread out, not up, as people talked about at the time about cities? Um, what was the result of this? Um, starting city shock, or was it, in fact, a sort of, oops, an, um, an early adoption of the yearning for a European-style um, urban density, and or a, a recognition of sort of the joys, you know, low, low rise next to downtown. What I found, uh, however, <laughs> sadly, was that in fact there were no ideas driving any of this. Uh, nothing that you could actually call an idea. There were vast amounts of huff and puff, uh, a lot of posturing and greed, uh, quite a lot of political horse trading, an avalanche of emotion, mostly fear, uh, and mostly guised as pragmatism. But where New York had been undergoing a very similar process at the same time with a range of public inquiries that directly paralleled Sydney's into things like public health and building height and civic beauty, uh, the treatment and the outcomes of these were starkly different. The debate in New York, although of course partly driven by commerce, also showed significant scholarship, um, philanthropic concerns, and logic in the arguments. In Sydney, by contrast, the debates within and without Parliament uh, were crude, ill-informed, and by large puerile. Uh, an unmanned called 
teetered for an hour while the building burned behind him uh, and then in, to the horror of the lunchtime shoppers in the Haymarket, this was, um, leapt to his death. And the, the other people were killed too. There were three or four other people in the basements who were also killed, but it was that particular event that drove uh, 12, almost 12 years, 11, 11 years later, drove the ban on skyscrapers. And what was interesting about that was that the arguments were all about hose length and ladder length because they couldn't get to this dude. Um, but, in fact, of course, um, they couldn't get to this dude and they didn't have ladders that long and they certainly didn't have ladders uh, 12 storeys long, which is how they, where they set the height limit. So there was nothing even vaguely logical about it and yet all of you read the Hansards and all of the stuff about hoses and ladders and, you know, I mean, maybe it's a boy thing, I don't know. Um, but it was very much about that sense of them not being able to reach people and the terror of fire, even though there had been no serious fires in skyscrapers at that time. So what uh, Sydney did was actually ban skyscrapers and um, set the limit at 12 storeys or 150 feet, not because it was anything to do with fire risk, but because there was already one 12 storey building in Sydney and this is it. And it's still there. Um, and it's still looks more or less as undistinguished as it does then. Nevertheless, that set the rules and it passed in effect. In New York, of course, by contrast, what they did was much more scholarly, and this is an example of a diagram of, of the lesson by David Mr. Bagger Boyd, who argued for the setback that was eventually culminated in the 1916 Dalian resolution that you'll all be familiar with, I imagine. And which, um, you know, 20 years on again, 14 years on, produced the Chrysler building. Um, but what was interesting about all that was, uh, for me, it was sort of disappointing to discover there were no ideas <laughs> in Sydney. Um, uh, and I have to say that chimed with my experience in politics in the city at the time, although luckily I wasn't writing about that because it would have been probably libelous. But um, so this, this relationship between ideas and built form or ideas in real world continued to interest me. And I, one of the reasons that it's interesting is that We tend to think, uh, who, who was trying to explain, Descartes was trying to explain how non-material events like perception um, interacted with and caused material events like movement or air and things in the world. So it's kind of the same question, how does that, how does that interaction happen? And it continues to be, for me it continues to be interesting, he, Descartes, postulated the Tyndall band, which you can see there in the middle of the person's head which um, <laughs> sort of explained it and sort of didn't because it's still this black box where everything interesting happens um, and still nobody really understood how, how it happened. But my point really is that um, for such an exchange to happen, for the ideas, the real world thing to happen, you need to have both and you need to very carefully preserve both and preserve the realm of each. And I want to just kind of talk around all that and then come back to that. So in 2014, here we can see century, a World Bank report found that, and I quote, almost 27% of policy reports were never cited, and about 72% were never downloaded at all. Um, I suspect that in academia the situation may be similar or worse. Um, uh, and, and there are all sorts of, of course, reasons for that, but there is um, always that temptation for academia to remain sort of hermetically sealed and to become self-referential. And there's a lot of uh, incentive, I think, in that direction. But theory without practice becomes, in my opinion, um, fatuous and narcissistic. Um, maybe you get something from that, but this is Raina Bonham, who actually is one of my heroes from 19 blah blah 65. Um, it's a fellow called French by Radio who has a very interesting thing called Um House, and the idea, of course, is that if you had enough building services and uh, control of traffic and heat and sound and food and all that, we would not need clothes and we would not need buildings. We could just live in these little bubbles like little kind of um, um, primitive mammals um, and be perfectly happy, which, of course, is silly. <laughs> Nevertheless, it became very influential as an idea. 
Um, equally, uh, I think practice without theory is very dangerous. This is uh, what happens when you have practice without any understanding of theory or idea. This is the ninth journal began to chop down the teaching here at Dr. Ray, um, which was appalling and uh, touching, actually. Uh, but this is a change which we don't expect to want. Of course, uh, and knocking down the three, so one of the things wasn't even for patients. And, yeah, I mean, they said it was for light rail, but really it was not for the light rail. It said that uh, six months could be reduced from the light rail contract which had been met before it was properly considered. Um, and the risk is to allow for traffic diversion to be built more quickly, but of course now it's been fought anyway. And for, uh, for exactly the same reason, because this contract was too hastily drawn up and met, and so that'll probably delay the thing in any, in any case. So they went for nothing. Essentially, they went for nothing. Um, so this, this question of engagement between theory and practice, uh, for me, it's not seems that weird, but because that looks like a, a farm diagram, but it is actually an illustration from a piece I wrote in the Herald a couple of years ago. And I love this image because it is an, an image, it, this one you would have drawn me before, but it's an image of, you know, it, for me, it's, it actually was talking about the city. I was talking about how Clover's regime is this kind of little island of civilization, and out there is just like mutiny. Um, and, uh, so, and, and that is quite typical of farms as well, where the home garden is all very organic and nice, and that's where you feed the children from, and then out there it's just like chemicals and um, and yeah. So it's quite a, 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 for me, it's quite a powerful metaphor, and I find it rather touching. But it also represents to me the town town distance um, or mind body distance. Because, uh, so that what I'm trying to get at is the idea of the city as a nature culture entanglement, if you like, or a theory practice entanglement. So, uh, I also want to sound, however, a word of warning about how that entanglement is structured. Um, because recent years have seen the worlds of theory and practice bleed into each other deliberately, of course, forming a world of you know, public private partnerships and so on, where everything from education to romance is seen as a marvel, where populism can seem a legitimate discipline in itself, and where science, supposedly the arbiter of truth, agrees to self-censor depending on um, who's paying the bills. And I'm thinking of a recent report on SBS uh, that the CSIRO admitted agreeing to change draft findings on water flow in the Murray uh, Darling River system for fear of not being paid by the board. So that seems to me very dangerous. And increasingly, as universities self conceive as corporations and take pride in the fact in the mammoth donations that they can extract from um, sometimes quite grubby real world players, um, there's inevitably, I think, that absorption of some of those values and behaviors of business. Uh, namely, profit, secrecy, and partiality. And that undermines truth and also, I think, destroys our capacity to think clearly and properly. And that, I think, is really dangerous. Dangerous not just for academia but for the world. Consider, uh, for example, universities now almost universal, I think, a refusal to distinguish between journalism and public relations. Both of them come under the under the communications rubric, as if, you know, as if, as if there's no, no difference between speaking the truth regardless and being paid to tell lies. How are they even similar? I mean, why are they not in separate faculties? To me, that seems bizarre and extraordinary, and yet it's like no one can tell the difference. So it seems to me that blurring those um, distinctions is is problematic, and that you end up in a sort of intellectual suburbia where you have um, not both, but neither world. So my plea, really, that I want to make is for clarity and for rather than continuing to blur the distinction between scholarship and practice, uh, for actively reinforcing those boundaries and um, clarifying the definitions 
Well, the remaining stuff is, you know, it seems to me that then once we have the truth faced, if you like, then the two worlds can properly enjoy it. Um, and hopefully give our cities and our countryside and the embodied meaning that I think we crave so that where our intellectual landscape looks like this, is a medieval walled city uh, in Malta, or like this, so that you end up with this um, clear distinction between uh, what is the academy and what is the world in order to preserve uh, the capacity of it. Thank <laughs> you.